this and I will not read that and I identified 21 thematic issues which I will just read them and give you my brief views on each after which I will then deliver the final orders of the court based on the findings of each one of us. So the thematic areas that I identified and which we have addressed variously in our judgments are as follows. Whether, number one, whether, they are, whether the basic structure doctrine, eternal clauses, eternity clauses and an amendability uh, doctrine applies in Kenya. Number two, who are the initiators and promoters of the BBI initiative? Three, the legality of the BBI steering committee and the BBI task force report in the constitution amendment process. Number four, whether the proposed amendments as contained in the Constitution Amendment Bill 2020 were by popular initiative and whether there was public participation. Five, whether the President of Kenya can initiate the process of amendment of the Constitution as a popular initiative. Number six, whether the IABC a requisite quorum to carry out its business in relation to the Amendment Bill. Number seven, the role of the IABC in Constitution Amendment by popular initiative. Number eight, whether the IABC was under an obligation to conduct a nationwide voter registration exercise and a verification of signatures. Number nine, whether the proposals contained in the Constitution Amendment Bill are to be submitted as separate and distinct referendum questions. Number 10, whether the High Court had jurisdiction to entertain the petitions on account of the principles of justiciability, mootness and ripeness. Number 11, whether it was constitutional for the uh, promoters of the amendment bill to create 70 uh, constituencies and allocate them. Number 12, whether there was necessity for legislation or legal framework on conduct of referenda. Number 13, whether civil proceedings can be instituted against a sitting president. Number 14, whether Mr. Uh, uh, whether Mr. Muigai Uhuru Kenyatta, as he was named by Mr. Olochier, was served with the petition number E426 of 2020 and the effect of the orders made by the High Court against his person. Number 15, again arising from Mr. Olochier's uh, uh, petition, whether the proceedings against the President, Mr. Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, were res judicata. Number 16, whether President Uhuru Muige Kenyatta contravened Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Number 17, whether promotion of the amendment bill violated Article 431A in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. Number 19, whether both, 18, sorry, whether both or either of the Houses of Parliament were informed from considering an, uh, the amendment bill in view of the Chief Justice's advisory for dissolution of parliament. Number 19, whether the High Court had in finding that the BBI task force did not create a legitimate expectation that the submissions by KNUN would be incorporated in the amendment bill. Number 20, whether the petitioners had made out a case for disclosure and publication of the BBI the steering committee's financial information, and lastly, whether the High Court had in law in admitting Amishi Kuria who were partisan. So as I indicated, I will not go into the submissions at all. I'll make a few comments on those issues. Um, on the basic structure doctrine, an amendability, an amendability theory and eternity clauses and their applicability in Kenya, I had the benefit of reading in draft the elaborate opinion of uh, my brother Justice Kiage on this issue, and I substantively agree with his Lordship's views and findings. However, I would like to make just a few um, 
additional remarks on the same. Taking into consideration the submissions by all the parties as far as the issue of basic structure is concerned, I do not think that there is any serious contestation that the Constitution of Kenya 2010 has a basic structure. What is not agreed upon are the matters that form the basic structure. The Attorney General, the BBI Secretariat, and the Honorable Raila Odinga argue that what constitutes the basic structure are the entrenched provisions listed under Article 255.1, uh, which says as follows, I will not read what it states. Whereas the appellants and some respondents who support the appeals were of the view that the basic structure of our constitution is not limited to the, matters, to the above matters, the contested issue is whether the basic structure doctrine limits the amendment power of the constitution as set out in Articles 255 to 257. Related to that issue, the first or fifth respondents argued that the amendment bill, though styled as introducing various amendments to the Constitution, it actually proposes a dismemberment of the Constitution. And they cited Richard Albert in his uh, uh, book, Constitutional Amendment and Dismemberment. Uh, then I pose a question. What is a constitutional amendment? In their petition, the first or fifth respondent stated, and I quote, Constitutional amendments come in two types. They can either be corrective or elaborative. Properly defined, a constitutional amendment is a correction made to better achieve the purpose of the existing constitution. Uh, I jump and read another paragraph. A constitutional amendment can also uh, be elaborative. An elaboration is a larger change uh, than an amendment insofar as it, uh, it does more than simply repair a fault or correct an error in the constitution making project, but does so in line with the current design of the constitution. Instead of repairing an error in the constitution, however, an elaboration advances the meaning of the constitution as it is presently understood." End of quote. I agree with the first or fifth respondent submission that an amendment corrects or modifies the existing system without fundamentally changing its nature. That an amendment operates within the parameters of the existing constitution, as stated by uh, Walter Murphy in Constitutions, Constitutionalism and Democracy Transitions in, contemporary, in the Contemporary World. It follows, therefore, that any amendment that alters uh, the constitutional the alters um, it follows therefore that any amendment that alters uh, the constitution fundamentally the constitution's fundamental values norms and the institutions cannot pass as an amendment it is in the nature of dismemberment in my view the omnibus constitutional amendment bill that seeks to fundamentally alter certain constitutional pillars of our supreme law, like the concept of separation of powers and the independence of the judiciary, is not an ordinary constitutional amendment. It amounts to a dismemberment of the constitution. Let me illustrate this uh, closely. Let me illustrate this by closely considering some aspects of the impugned amendment bill. This bill, this omnib uh, omnibus bill is titled, A Bill for an Act to Amend the Constitution by Popular Initiative. It contains 74 proposed con constitutional amendments. Some of the proposed amendments have the effect of interfering with the concept of separation of powers, which is well ingrained in our constitution. Article 1, Sabbatical 1 of the Constitution stipulates that all the sovereign power belongs to the people of Kenya and shall be exercised in accordance with the Constitution. That sovereign power is delegated to Parliament and the Legislative Assemblies uh, in 
That sovereign power is delegated to parliament and the, and the legisl legislative assemblies in the county governments, the national executive and the executive structures in the county governments, and the judiciary and the independent tribunals. This arrangement ensures that uh, these three broad arms of government remain distinct from each other and do not encroach upon each other's functions, but subject only to the usual constitutional and st uh, statutory checks and balances. Clause 44 of the amended bill proposes to create the office of the Judiciary Ombudsman by introducing a new Article 172A, and that proposed clause uh, states as follows. There is established the office of Judiciary Ombudsman. The President shall nominate and with the approval of the Senate appoint the Judiciary Ombudsman. The Judiciary Ombudsman shall receive and conduct inquiries into complaints against judges, registrars, magistrates, and other judicial officers and other staff of the judiciary. Sensitize and promote engagement with the public on the role and performance of the judiciary, and C, improve transparency and accountability of the judiciary. It continues, it sets out very many functions. I'll jump the rest. There are a few observations that I wish to make regarding this proposed amendment as relates to the independence of the judiciary. One, the fact that the judiciary ombudsman shall be an appointee of the president entrenches executive control in the Judicial Service Commission and by extension in the judiciary. Under Article 171.2, four of the 11 uh, members are appointed by the executive. If the proposed bill goes through, the executive's appointees shall be a total of five. Number two, of even greater concern is, the, uh, proposed, uh, is that the proposed duties and functions of the Judiciary Ombudsman, whose allegiance is to the President, has the effect of making the holder of that office a terror to judges, magistrates, and all judicial staff. That office shall not only receive and conduct in, uh, inquiries with the complaints against judges, magistrates, registrars, and all judicial staff, but will also apply, will also play a critical role in the removal of judges. Clause 41 proposes to amend Article 168.2 of the Constitution so that it will read, and I quote, the removal of a judge may be initiated only by the Judicial Service Commission acting on the motion by the Judiciary Ombudsman. End of quote. In passing the 2010 Constitution, Kenyans wanted to have a strong and independent judiciary, but the proposed amendment is the exact antithesis of such a judiciary. If a presidential appointee is empowered to receive and investigate a complaint against judges, craft a motion for the judge's removal, and present it for consideration by the Judicial Service Commission, where he sits as an ex-official member. It is not difficult to discern that in making judicial pronouncements, most judges would be very cautious of going against the will of the president. Otherwise, the president may resort to the use of his or her appointee to initiate removal proceedings of the judge because he who pays the piper calls the tune. This is an ingenious and subtle clawback to the independence of the judiciary. I highly doubt whether there was any meaningful civic education and public discourse on the issue during the promotion of the impugned bill. Decisional and institutional independence of the judiciary in a democratic state should be jealously guarded and before any constitutional amendment that is likely to interfere with the same is made, the people must be given an opportunity to exercise their primary constituent power. In the final report of the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission, Clause 13.5.4 at page 209, among the things that the people said about the judiciary are as follows, and I quote, the independence of the judiciary should be entrenched in the Constitution. Two, the Constitution should ensure 
that there is no interference in the judiciary by the executive and by politicians, end of quote. If, if this is not executive interference in the work of the judiciary, then I do not know what else amounts to such interference. Number five, there seems to be a duplication of mandates between the Judicial Service Commission and the Judiciary Ombudsman insofar as the function to receive and investigate complaints is concerned. Article 172.1c states that one of the functions of the Judicial Service Commission is to appoint, receive complaints against, in, uh, against, investigate and remove from office or otherwise discipline registrars, magistrates, other judicial officers and other staff of the judiciary in the manner prescribed by an act of parliament. Without any proposed deletion or amendment to the above provision, the proposed Article 172A, 3, uh, 3A states as follows, and I quote, the judiciary ombudsman shall receive and conduct inquiries into complaints against judges, registrars, magistrates, and other judicial officers and other staff of the judiciary. These two almost similar constitutional provisions will create parallel and incompatible centers of power, which is not good for the country. There is a possibility of parallel complaints against judges and judicial officers being instituted uh, before the two uh, offices. What would happen if, there are, if they, were, they were to arrive at different conclusions on the question of removal? Turning to, let the, to the legislature, Clause 29, 32, and 33 of the Amendment Bill proposes to remove the requirement for vetting by the National Assembly of Cabinet Ministers, Secretary to the Cabinet, and Principal Secretaries. Clause 31 proposes to introduce the position of deputy ministers whose appointment shall not be vetted by parliament. There is also the proposal to do away with a pure presidential system and replace it with a hybrid one where there will be a prime minister, deputy prime minister, cabinet ministers, attorney general, and the leader of the position who will also sit in parliament. The people of Kenya in promulgating the 2010 constitution opted for a pure presidential system. And in my view, the proposal interferes with the concept of separation of powers as members of the executive will also be members of the legislature. I will now, I'll briefly now look at uh, the issue of uh, increase of constituencies as proposed in the amendment bill. Under clause 10 and 74, as read together with the second schedule of this amendment bill, the promoters of the bill proposed to increase the number of, constitu of the constituencies from two, uh, 290 to 360. However, without proposing to delete Article 89.2 of the Constitution, which empowers the IABC to review the names and boundaries of constituencies, the promoters decided to allocate the proposed 70 additional constituencies to 29 counties, but left it to the IABC to, to determine their boundaries. The IABC protested, and rightly so, saying that it has the exclusive mandate of delimiting constituencies as per Article 89.2. I have no hesitation in stating that the task of review of names and the limitation of our constituencies exclusively belongs to the IABC. The people of Kenya decided that the task of delimitation of boundaries should be handled by an independent commission following the criteria set out under Article 89, 5, 6, and 7 of the Constitution. The task of deciding which county should have extra constituencies should have been handled by the IABC. Entrusting such a delicate responsibility to persons with declared political interest is tantamount to gerrymandering, which James Rowley describes, and I quote, as the process of dividing political units in ways that deliberately create advantages for incumbents or their political allies by placing voters based on their pred uh, predicated behavior 
are the polls in districts that dilute the power, uh, dilute the vote of some voters and consolidate, consolidate the votes of others. End of quote. In conclusion, on that issue, it is not all the proposed, all the 74 proposed amendments that seek to fundamentally alter the basic structure of the social contract that Kenyans entered into when they gave to themselves the Constitution of Kenya 2010 after decades of political struggle. But the few that I have highlighted point to attempts to alter the fundamental aspects of the basic structure of our Constitution. And that, to me, is constitutional dis uh, di uh, dismemberment. That is why I would agree with the learned judges that it is necessary that we replicate the same procedure that we used to give to ourselves the 2010 Constitution if we have to fundamentally amend certain provisions of the Constitution. Regarding the provisions that have been referred to as unamendable, immutable, unchangeable, unalterable, irrevocable, or eternity clauses, as they have been called, Yaniv Rosnai, who has been quoted before, says this. They serve as a mechanism for limiting the amendment power, but they do not and cannot limit the primary constituent power. He further argues that un unamendable provisions are subject to changes introduced by extra constitutional forces, read primary constituent power uh, uh, assembly of the people, or through judicial interpretation. From the foregoing, I would agree with the learned judges that the basic structure doctrine is applicable in Kenya, and that certain fundamental aspects of the Constitution of Kenya 2010 cannot be am amended except through the, uh, the sovereign primary constituent power of the people. However, I do not think that the alteration of the basic structure must be undertaken through the repeal of the Constitution and promulgation of another, as argued by some of the proponents of the doctrine of basic, uh, basic structure. Any provision that may be found to be part of the basic structure of our Constitution may be amended by the people by exercise of their primary constituent power after civic education, public participation, constituent assembly debate, and a referendum. Chapter 16 only applies to pure amendments of the Constitution that do not alter any feature that forms the basic structure. The Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020, as structured, violates certain components of our Constitution's basic structure. On issue number two, who are the initiators and promoters of the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill? I will not take much time. I just want to keep on saying that the President in the submissions made before this court, confirmed that he established both the BBI Task Force and the BBI Steering Committee pass on to the functions and obligations conferred upon him by Articles 131 and 132 of the Constitution. From the foregoing, there can be no dispute that the President was the initiator of the BBI initiative, having established and gazetted, having established and gazetted under his hand the BBI Task Force and the BBI Steering Committee. I am in agreement with the High Court's finding that the amendment bill was an initiative of the President. On the question of the promoter of the amendment bill, the BBI Secretariat and Honorable Raila Odinga, through their senior counsel, Mr. Otiende Amolo, submitted that the bill was promoted by Honorable Junette. Mohammed and Honorable Dennis Waweru, the co-chairpersons of the BBI National Secretariat. The same argument was also advanced by the Attorney General, who added that the BBI Secretariat was a voluntary political alliance of political uh, players in Kenya, distinct from the BBI Task Force and the BBI Steering Committee. Uh, after going through all this, I find that uh, there is therefore no dispute that the promoter of the amendment bill was the BBI National Secretariat. 
number three, legality of the BBI steering committee and its report, um, and whether it was a popular initiative. It is evident that one of the major functions of the BBI steering committee was to propose, among other things, constitutional changes that were thought necessary for the implementation of the recommendations uh, contained in the BBI task, uh, task Force report and submit, a comprehensive, uh, uh, and submit a comprehensive report to the government. If this was intended, as it turned out to be, a move towards amendment of the Constitution as a popular initiative, that is where the rain started beating the process. Then I asked the question, what is a popular initiative? It is defined as a process of a partic participatory democracy that empowers the people to, pro uh, to propose the legislation and to enact or reject the laws at the polls, independent of the law-making power of the governing body. My sister, Justice Okwengu, has covered it very well. I will not dwell on the same. From what I have said, um, in pages that I have skipped. I agree with the learned judges that the BBI steering committee had no constitutional mandate to initiate constitutional changes under Article 257 of the Constitution disguised as a popular initiative. This was a move initiated by the political elite, not by the people of Kenya. It was not disputed that the promoters of the amendment bill simply posted English versions uh, sorry, I'm, you know, I'm on issue number four, whether there was public participation in the, in, the, in the passage of the bill. It was not disputed that the promoters of the amendment bill simply posted English versions of it on the internet. The appellants did not tell the High Court the number of Kenyans that have reliable access to internet and were able to read and understand the English version of the impugned bill. Article 7.1 of the Constitution says that the national language of the Republic is Kiswahili, while Article 7.2 provides that the official languages of the Republic are Kiswahili and English. Considering that the national language is Kiswahili and all major political gatherings are addressed in Kiswahili, it was dishonest on the part of the promoters to purport to have reached out to the masses by simply posting on the internet the amendment bill in English language. The 76th respondent submitted that according to the 2019 Kenya population and housing census, only 22.6% of Kenyans aged three and above use internet, while only 10.4% use a computer. And turning to Article 10, participation of the people must be done in a transparent manner. Transparency is one of the major values and principles of governance that bind all state organs, state officers, public officers, and persons whenever any of them makes or implements public policy decisions. Although more than a million registered voters signed in support of the amendment bill, it was not demonstrated that the exercise was conducted transparently. Transparency in this case required that before collection of the signatures is done, proper civic education is conducted where, among others, each of the 74 proposed amendments would be well explained to the people so that they understand and appreciate the ramifications of each of them. Some of the proposed amendments are rather superfluous, and strictly speaking, they ought not to have been proposed as constitutional amendments by the promoters. At best, they could only be proposed as statutory amendments, but were intentionally included in the amendment bill, and appropriate statutory amendment bills drawn, the, uh, drawn by, uh, by the promoters to act as sweeteners to coax voters into supporting the proposed constitutional amendment bills. An example is Clause 3, which proposes to create a new Article 11A on economy and shared prosperity, and the same reads as follows. 
that this constitution recognizes the need for an economic system that provides equitable opportunities for all the people of Kenya to benefit from the economic growth in a comprehensive, fair, and su sustainable matter, uh, manner. Uh, I will not read the rest. Together with the amendment bill, the promoters also drew the micro and small enterprises amendment bill, which inter alia proposed to give youth uh, owned enterprises a seven year tax break. Another one, another example of a bill that accompanied the proposed constitutional amendment bill uh, was the Higher Education Loans Board Act 1995 to give loanees a grace period of four years from the date of completion of their studies and to exempt loanees without a source of income from paying interest on the loans advanced to them. I say this about uh, the amendment, the proposed amendment and those bills. These are definitely very good and appealing proposals, but anchoring them on the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020, that also proposed very far-reaching alterations on the basic structure of our Constitution was a clear bait to entice the populace and particularly the young registered voters who are the majority to support the amendment bill without proper civic education on all the contents of the entire bill. Another issue was raised by the Third Way Alliance, uh, uh, the 19 respondent, who questioned the speed at which uh, some county assemblies passed the amendment bill without any public participation. The county assembly of Tanariva is a classic example in Abe Semi Buere uh, versus uh, the County Assembly of Tana River, Nyakundi J established that the County Assembly of Tana River considered and approved the amendment bill on 23rd of February 2021, whereas it had published in the local newspapers and social media that there would be public, uh, public hearings and a presentation of memoranda on the bill on 25th of February 2021. The learned judge declared that the resolution to pass the bill was tainted with procedural illegality and was therefore fatally defective and unconstitutional. It is also on record that members of, the, of county assemblies, MCS, demanded and were given car grants of 2 million Kenya shillings each shortly before an overwhelming majority of county assemblies passed the amendment bill, paving way for it to be placed before parliament under Article 257.7. Whereas it is desirable that MCS be facilitated in their performance of their legislative work in our county governments, and therefore the car grants may have been lawful, its timing was said to have been deliberately intended to influence them to pass the amendment bill. The Salaries and the Remuneration Commission had previously raised various objections to the car grants, but the commission suddenly changed its position and gave them a green light and gave a green light to the car grants during the promotion of the impugned bill. The 19th respondent asserted. It was also demonstrated that some senior public servants were deployed to go to their counties to promote and campaign for uh, for the support of the amendment bill. In Robert Gakuru and another, uh, this court held that public participation must be real and not illusory, should not be treated as a mere formality because it is a constitutional requirement and must be attained quantitatively and quali uh, uh, qualitatively. I may add that public participation must be done transparently and in demonstrable utmost good faith without any coercion. All these acts and omissions I have highlighted above amounted to violation of uh, certain aspects of Article 10, in particular participation of the people, inclusiveness, integrity, transparency, and accountability. Amendment of a country's constitution ought to be a very sacrosanct public undertaking, and its processes must be undertaken very transparently and in strict compliance with the country's laws. Deliberate compromise of the process will invalidate even a well-intentioned proposal. As George Washington put it, and I quote, if in the opinion of the people, 
the distribution or modification of the constitutional powers be in any particular wrong, let it be corrected by an amendment in the way in which the Constitution designates. But let there be no change by usurpation. For though this, in one instance, may be the instrument of good, it is the customary weapon by which free governments are destroyed. End of quote. In view of the foregoing, I find and hold that uh, amendment, uh, the amendment bill was not, by pop was not by popular initiative. And though there was a degree of public participation in its development and passing, it was not in accordance with the national values and principles under Article 10 of the Constitution. On whether the President can in, uh, initiate the process of amendment of the Constitution as a popular initiative, I will simply say that I hold and find that under our constitutional architecture, the President cannot initiate the process of amendment of the Constitution as a popular initiative. The President's intentions in, in initiating the process were noble but the process of, of its execution was not in line with the Constitution. Whether the IABC had requisite quorum to carry out its business in relation to the amendment bill, I agree with what has been said by my other colleagues. And I'll just, I'll just read a few parts of my judgment. It follows, therefore, where a court, having declared a provision of a statute as unconstitutional, but does not state the effective date of that declaration, the declaration becomes effective from the date of the judgment, unless an appeal is preferred against the decision. Then I look at the case of... Uh, uh, Isaiah Abiwat Kangoni versus uh, Independent Electoral uh, Boundaries Commission, uh, pronouncements by the Supreme Court on some matters. Then I look at uh, uh, Mwita's decision in Katiba Institute uh, versus Attorney General. And then I say, for these reasons, I would dismiss the Attorney General's challenge to the landed judge's finding that the IABC lacked the requisite uh, uh, quorum to make decisions connected with the amendment bill. The, uh, number seven, on the role of the IABC in the Constitution Amendment by popular initiative. Muslims for Human Rights, the 82nd respondent, contended that the IABC cannot undertake verification of signatures and registered voters without an enabling legal framework in place. According to an affidavit filed by the IABC in the High Court in response to the petition, the IABC maintains a register of voters that contains biometric data and other particulars of every registered uh, voter. Section two of the Elections Act defines the term biometric to mean unique identifiers or attributes including fingerprints, hand geometry, earlobe geometry, retina and iris, uh, iris patterns, voice waves, DNA and signatures. The IABC submitted that uh, a signature is just one of the unique identifiers it can use to verify whether a supporter of the popular initiative is a registered voter, that it also considers the unique identifiers of each registered voter. IABC has a record of all form A for each registered voter that contains uh, the signature or thumb, thumbprint of a voter, their constituency, county, county ward, registration center, surname, other names, identity card number, or, Ken uh, or Kenyan passport number, the date of birth, sex, residential address, contact, telephone, uh, postal address, email, and particulars of any disability a registered voter may have. 
when the promoters went out to collect signatures of supporters of the initiative, the form of the collection of signatures that they had been given by the IABC required the supporters of the initiative to also indicate their name, identity card number, or passport number, constituency card, war, uh, sorry, county, ward, polling station, mobile number, and so on. These are certainly some of the unique identifiers of a registered voter. These are certainly some of the unique identifiers of a registered voter. A signature or thumbprint is one of them, but is not the only one. People's signature can change with time for various reasons, be it age, injury, or disability of their hands, uh, and so on. And it is therefore unrealistic to say to rely on signatures only to identify registered voters. By use of modern technology, I believe it is not difficult to compare the information contained in Form A of a registered voter with the information compare, uh, captured in the form for collection of signatures of supporters of a popular initiative and determine whether one person, uh, determine whether the person is a registered voter. In view of the foregoing, I do not entirely agree with the learned judge's finding that the IABC's role under Article 257.4 involves both the ascertainment of, uh, of numbers of registered voters in support of a popular initiative for amending the Constitution as well as the verification of the, of the authenticity of those signatures. It follows, therefore, that there is no Constitu uh, constitutional or statutory requirement for a legal framework for verification of signatures under Article 257.4 of the Constitution. What is required is a legal uh, or regulatory framework for verification of registered voters. I, however, agree with the learned judges that the administrative procedures that were developed by the IABC are invalid because they were developed without public participation by a commission that did not have court. Next issue is whether the IABC was under obligation to conduct a nationwide voter registration uh, exercise before anticipated referendums. Uh, I'll jump a few pages and state as follows. It is evident that there is constitutional and statutory requirements for continuous registration of voters, and this is imperative. As the 76th respondent put it, uh, is, it is informed by the fact that hundreds of thousands of citizens become eligible to be registered as voters every month. The register of voters must also be updated from time to time as, as required under Section 8 of the Elections Act. So I come to the conclusion that I find and hold that uh, there is no consti uh, co uh, constitutional or statutory requirement for the IABC to carry out a nationwide voter registration before any proposed referendum but the Commission is under a constitutional and statutory obligation to do a continuous registration of voters in each constituency. I further find and hold that in view of that constitutional and statutory obligation, the IABC should continually sensitize Kenyans about its role and encourage them to continually register as voters, except at such periods as specified by, the, by statute when voter registration should not be done. The next issue is whether the proposals in the amendment bill are to be submitted as separate and distinct referendum questions. A plain reading of Article 257 requires that the proposed amendments be reduced into a bill, which is then submitted to the people in a referendum. What is to be submitted to the people is not a question or questions, it is a bill. However, the IABC may require the people to approve or disapprove the bill by answering a question or questions, either in the affirmative or in the negative. The IABC, as an independent constitutional body, has the sole responsibility of conducting or supervising a referendum, and it is up to it to determine how the referendum 
uh, how the referendum should be conducted, subject only to constitutional and statutory guidelines. For example, under Section 49 of the Elections Act, the question or questions framed by the IABC must be approved by Parliament. A bill is a proposed legislation and may contain more than one proposed amendment. As stated by the learned judges, the drafters of the Constitution were alive to the fact that a bill to amend the Constitution may propose different amendments. The bill ought to be subjected to a proper public participation where each and every proposed amendment is explained, debated upon, and well-informed views taken before the people eventually vote on the same. That notwithstanding, it is improper to lump together 74 proposed constitutional amendments in a bill. I do not therefore agree with the learned judges that what is to be presented to, uh, what is to be uh, subjected to the referendum is a question or questions. It is the amendment bill, but the people are to approve or disapprove of the bill by answering a question or questions as framed by IABC and approved by Parliament. The next issue is whether the High Court had jurisdiction to entertain the petitions on account of the principles of justiciability, mootness, and ripeness. I have defined, in my view, what those concepts mean. Then I've looked at the jurisdiction of uh, the High Court under Article 165, that the High Court has original jurisdiction um, to determine the question whether a right or fundamental freedom in the Bill of Rights has been denied, violated, infringed, or threatened. A close examination of the issues raised in the consolidated petitions yields the interpretation that the issues, in their very sense, are not mere political questions, but are in uh, their very nature, constitutional issues requiring the determination by a constitutional court. Going by the nature of the issues raised in the petitions and the jurisdiction of the High Court, as stated above, I find that the issues could only have been determined by the High Court in the exercise of its jurisdiction under Article 165 of the Constitution. In this regard, therefore, the High Court could not have exercised difference as uh, argued by some of the appellants since, firstly, it had jurisdiction to entertain the consolidated petitions, and secondly, the issues could only could, uh, uh, could, have, only be, could only have been determined uh, properly and adequately adjudicated upon in a judicial process. That may be perceived by some people as unwarranted judicialization of politics. However, it must be understood that the judi uh, judicialization of politics in our country is a function of the 2010 Constitution that has in several ways widened the scope of the judiciary and in particular commands judges to defend the Constitution. Whereas judges must exercise judicial restraint appropriately and respect the doctrine of separation of powers, when litigants come to court and, and claim that any person whether from the executive or legislative arm of the government is violating or threatening to violate the Constitution, judges must look at the other. Uh, on the issue of ripeness, I have concluded that I find and hold that the, the petitions were neither moot nor non-justiciable. The petitioners demonstrated that there had been some violation of constitutional values and principles in the way the amendment bill had been developed, had been mooted and processed, and the constitution was about to be dismembered unless the court intervened. To that extent, the petitions did not offend the principles of ripeness. Whereas the process of amending the constitution was still ongoing, there was every indication that a majority of county assemblies as well as parliament were poised to approve the impugned bill, which they eventually did, and thus pave way for a constitutionally flawed referendum. A transformative constitution cannot countenance that. Had the learned judges declined to assume jurisdiction on account of, uh, of uh, the principles of justiciability, mootness, and ripeness, they would have violated their respective oaths of office, which they individually subscribed to. 
A judge's order of office requires the judge, among other things, to protect, administer, and defend the Constitution without any fear, favor, bias, affection, ill will, prejudice, or any other political, religious, or, or any other influence. The learned judges who are true to their oath of office, I so find. The next issue is whether it was constitutional for the promoters of the amendment bill to create uh, the 70 uh, constituencies. Um, I dealt with that uh, earlier, and I just conclude to say that uh, in view of the foregoing, I agree with the learned judges that uh, the second schedule to the amendment bill, insofar as it proposed to predetermine the allocation of seven constituencies, is unconstitutional. Next issue is whether there was necessity for legislation or legal framework uh, on conduct of referenda. Um, The judges, sorry, the learned judges held that the Elections Act does not meet the intention of the drafters of the Constitution in recommending that Parliament enacts a referendum act to govern the, uh, the conduct of a referendum. That notwithstanding, the judges held the referendum may still be undertaken as long as the constitutional expectations, values, principles, and objects are met. I entirely agree. In my view, it is not the absence of an appropriate legal framework that posed the greatest challenge to the amendment bill and the proposed referendum. The political, elit uh, the political elitism, opaqueness, and lack of transparency that characterized the entire process of the proposed amendment of the Constitution were the greatest impediments. The Constitution the Elections Act and the Independent Electoral and, uh, uh, Boundaries Commission Act contain broad provisions that can be used to conduct a referendum as long as commitment to adhere to the stipulated principles, values, and statutory uh, dictates is observed. The next issue is whether the civil proceedings can be instituted against a sitting president. Uh, this was well covered by my brother, Justice Gatembu. And, uh, I'll just say, quote, uh, in a, a decision, Kenya Human Rights Commission and another versus uh, Attorney General, where I sat with uh, Justice Gatembu and Justice Murgo, the court held, and I quote, in effect, a plain and ordinary interpretation of Article 143.2 would infer that the President's immunity is in limited to proceedings instituted during his or her term in office and two, to anything done or not done in exercise of the president's powers under the Constitution. Put differently, the immunity does not extend to acts or omissions that have resulted in civil proceedings commenced prior to, uh, prior to assumption of office of the president or, or that were not, sorry, let me take that uh, again to anything done or not done in the exercise of the president's powers under the Constitution. Put differently, the immunity does not extend to acts or omissions that have, uh, have resulted in civil proceedings commenced uh, prior uh, to assumption of the office of the president or that were not in, uh, in, in exercise of the president's powers. Uh, I'll skip the rest of the quotation. I have not been persuaded to hold otherwise. The President of Kenya does not enjoy absolute immunity against civil proceedings during the tenure of office, and neither is the President above the law. He is subject to the Constitution. However, no civil proceedings can be instituted against the President during the President's tenure of office if the complaint is based on any act or omission of the president in the exercise of the, of the powers conferred upon the president by the constitution. If the president, in his or her own private capacity, not in the exercise of the president's constitutional powers, were to do anything against a person's private rights, 
that person would have liberty to file a civil suit against the president in his personal capacity during the tenure of office of the president. But if the president, in exercise of powers conferred by the Constitution, does or fails to do anything that is alleged to be contrary to the Constitution or statute, civil proceedings can only be instituted against the president when his or her term comes to an end. Going back to the, um, sorry, issue number 14, was the appellant, the president, Mr. Uhuru, uh, 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 sorry, was the, was, the, was the appellant, Mr. Uhuru Kenyatta, afforded a fair hearing. To answer this question, I shall consider whether the appellant was served with the petition number 426-2020 and a hearing notice and therefore are given an opportunity to be heard. Rules of natural justice require that every person must be accorded a reasonable opportunity to be heard before an adverse decision is made against them. If that is not done, any result, resultant decision that agrees the person is a nullity, as was held in Onyango Olaf versus Attorney General. Counsel for the appellant submitted that there was no service for the uh, there was no service of the petition upon their client. The petitioner, Isaac Aluchir, filed an affidavit of service dated 16 January 2021, in which he stated that he electronically served the appellant as it was impossible to effect personal service upon him. The email address was, uh, he used was uh, cos at president.go.ke. The record of appeal shows that on 21st of January 2021, the trial court directed, and I quote, all petitions in the seven petitions to serve the petitions on all the other parties by close of business on 22nd January 2021. The deputy registrar to facilitate the process where necessary. The respondents, interested parties, and Amishi to file their respondents uh, to, the, uh, to the various petitions within 14 days of tomorrow. Then the record, uh, I've looked at what it shows, it kept on showing that uh, the first respondent uh, who was named in his personal capacity as Mr. Uhuru uh, Kenyatta uh, was um, unrepresented. So I proceed and make the conclusion that, uh, but assuming the email address that I've read is the official one of the Office of the President or State House, the petitioner did not demonstrate that it was proper to sue the President in his personal capacity, but purport to effect service upon him through the official email address of the Presidency. In my view, the petitioner should have sought leave to effect substituted service by way of ad advertisement in the local newspapers if he could not get the personal email address of uh, the president. Considering the kind of orders that were being sought against the appellant and the effects uh, of grant of the same, the trial court ought to have been satisfied that uh, there had been proper service of court process upon the appellant. I find and hold that uh, there was no proof of service of the petition and the hearing notice upon the appellant. The appellant's constitutional right to a fair hearing as guaranteed under Article 50 of the Constitution was violated in that he was condemned and heard. Consequently, all the orders made against Mr. Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, as named by Mr. Oluchir in his personal capacity, cannot stand. I would therefore set aside the declaration made by the High Court that Mr. Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta contravened Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Next issue were whether were the proceedings against Mr. Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta res judicata. I proceed to make the conclusion that, on my part, I cannot fault the findings made by the learned judges. 
I agree with them that the issue as to whether the president could establish a committee to initiate a change or amendment of the Constitution outside the remit of Articles 255 to 257 of the Constitution had not been raised in the earlier petition. The learned judges were therefore bound to hear and pronounce themselves on that important issue. Number, uh, the next issue is whether the Constitution Amendment Bill 2020 violated Article 431A in view of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Article 431A states as follows, and I quote, every person has the right to the highest attainable standard of health, which includes the right to health care, uh, health care services, including reproductive health care. Mr. Omoke argued that the president was in total violation of the Constitution when he authorized or used public funds to initiate and promote the impugned bill amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. His argument was twofold. First, that since the country was and is still engulfed by a pandemic that poses a serious health challenge to all, the state should have prioritized the fight against the spread uh, of COVID-19 virus by allocating sufficient resources rather than engaging in political activities. Secondly, the president and his agents, by organizing or attending what he termed as, I quote, massive super, super spreader events, including rallies and signature collection to promote the BBI agenda amidst the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, was a violation of Article 431A. It was also in disregard of the COVID-19 directives and regulations issued by the president himself and the Ministry of Health banning public gatherings, maintenance of social order, and putting on masks, Council added. My conclusion on the matter is that While I agree that holding public rallies that are attended by thousands of people militates against COVID-19 mitigative measures, there was no empirical data or scientific evidence provided to the learned judges to enable them to make a determinative finding that the holding of the said events per se amounted to a violation of Article 431A of the Constitution. And regarding the amounts that were spent my conclusion is that I find that there was no sufficient evidence to enable the learned judges to reach a finding that the expenditure amounted to a constitutional violation. I will therefore dismiss the gro the, that ground of the cross appeal. Next issue is whether both or either of the Houses of Parliament were informed from, uh, from considering the Constitution Amendment Bill in view of the Chief Justice's advisory for the dissolution of Parliament. I have found that uh, there were orders that were issued by Justice uh, Courier in several matters. The High Court observed that it was in the public interest not to uh, subject the country to parliamentary elections before exhaustively interrogating the constitution constitutionality of the uh, advisory by the Chief Justice and that public interest supported the issuance of an order suspending any decision to dissolve Parliament. The amendment bill was tabled before the National Assembly and the Senate on the 4th of March 2021 for the first reading. A vote of the, on the amendment bill was taken in both houses on 6th, or 6th and the 11th of May 2021, respectively. As of the date of the, as of the date of tabling and voting on the amendment bill, the orders issued by the High Court suspending the uh, implementation of the advisory by the Chief Justice were still in force, and there was no indication that the orders had been vacated. Accordingly, none of the Houses of Parliament were, uh, was informed from considering any of the, uh, uh, from considering and or debating the amendment bill owing to the advisory opinion by the Chief Justice. 
Next issue is whether the High Court erred in finding that the task force did not create a legitimate expectation on the submission by KNU, uh, KNUN uh, that, it, that it would be incorporated in the Constitutional Amendment Bill. I've looked at that and uh, My conclusion is that there is no demonstration. Sorry. In this regard, the fact that the proposals by KNUN were not incorporated in the amendment bill cannot be a basis of invalidating the amendment bill. It was not demonstrated that it was only the proposals by KNUN that were not incorporated in the amendment bill. For these reasons, I would dismiss the appeal by KNUN. Number 20, whether the petitioners that had made out a case for disclosure and publication of the steering committee's financial information. I have considered what uh, Mr. Morara said in that cross appeal and come to the conclusion that there is no demonstration at all by Mr. Morara that he requested for any information from the President, Honorable Raila Odinga, and the BBI steering committee regarding the budget and public funds allocated and utilized in promoting the impugned bill. The learned judges cannot therefore be faulted for declining to issue their foresaid orders. Consequently, I would dismiss Mr. Morara's cross appeal on the issue. And the last one is whether the High Court erred in admitting Amishi Kurie, who are partisan. My conclusion is that, in my view, there is no evidence that the Amishi who were admitted to the High Court proceedings were biased. Their respective briefs were of great assistance to the learned judges in determining the issues I have alluded to. Although the Amishi were not parties to the High Court matters, having been admitted in the proceedings in that limited capacity, in the appeals, the first appellant named them as respondents, and therefore they had to file submissions in reply. I must add that I found the submissions quite useful in this appeal. Disposition. Having determined all the issues that were, we considered germane in this consolidated appeals, the final orders of the court are as follows. A. We uphold the judgment of the High Court to the extent that we affirm the following. One, the basic structure doctrine is applicable in Kenya. Sichale J.A. dissenting. Two, the basic structure doctrine limits the amendment power set in Articles 255 to 257 of the Constitution. Sichale J.A. dissenting. Sorry, I take this back. Two, the basic structure doctrine limits the uh, amendment power set out in, uh, in Articles 255 to 257 of the Constitution. Okwengu J.A. and the Sichale J.A. dissenting. Number three, the basic structure of the Constitution can only be altered through the primary constituent power, which must include four sequential processes, namely civic education, public participation and collection of views, constituent assembly debate, and ultimately a referendum. Okwengu 
Katembu and Sichale JGA dissenting. Four, civil court proceedings can be instituted against the president or a person performing in the functions of the office of the president during their tenure of office in respect of anything done or not done contrary to the Constitution, to your J.A. dissenting. Five, the president does not have authority under the Constitution to initiate changes to the Constitution and that a constitutional amendment a constitutional amendment can only be initiated by parliament through a parliamentary initiative under Article 256 or through a popular initiative under Article 257 of the Constitution. Six, the steering committee on the implementation of the building bridges to a United Kenya Task Force report, the BBI steering committee, has no legal capacity to initiate any action towards promoting constitutional changes under Article 257 of the Constitution. Seven, the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 is unconstitutional under usurpation of the people's exercise of sovereign power. Eight, the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 cannot be subjected to a referendum in the absence of evidence of continuous voter registration by the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, Sichale J.A. dissenting. Number nine, the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission does not have the requisite quorum for purposes of carrying out its business relating to the conduct of the proposed referendum, including the verification whether the initiative as submitted by the Building Bridges Secretariat is supported by the requisite number of registered voters in accordance with Article 257.4 of the Constitution. Sichale J.A. dissenting. Number 10, at the time of the launch of the Constitution of Kenya Amendment Bill 2020 and the collection of endorsement signatures,